Thank you. So let me call the last speaker in the interest of time. It's Professor Charles Sable, also from Columbia Law School. And, uh, and this talk will deal with uh, issues of uh, novel contractual, uh, innovative ways of uh, corporate governance or, or supplementing uh, corporate governance. governance. Professor Sable. Thank you. I, was, I had a copy of the, uh, the, it's a pleasure to be here to begin with. I had a copy of the program which said I was going to speak and that this panel would be in the afternoon and I was counting on the intervening hours to uh, recover from jet lag. And so I haven't. Um, uh, so we'll get to see whether I'm capable of thinking while I'm asleep. Um, I know that's a dream of all of us, uh, and I'll put it to the, the test for myself. Now, um, my theme is very speculative. I don't mean uh, speculative in the sense uh, that it reflects my wishes or uh, some imagination of a hazy future, speculative in the sense that it tries to connect some indubitable and uh, massive changes in the nature of the corporation and its boundaries uh, with the possibility, the mere possibility, of changes in corporate law. Such changes are clearly underway in contract. They're having an influence uh, in regulation. And the question of immediate interest is whether those changes will uh, percolate through to corporate law. So, uh, the central claim is that the uh, familiar, very general model of the uh, principal agent model of the corporation uh, is under severe pressure uh, from the continuous innovation and knowledge economy. So let me say what the principal agent model is, uh, where the pressure comes from, uh, and how precisely it manifests itself uh, with the potential for this percolation through to a corporate law. So as, you, as I presume you know, and as I'm sure you do know, um, uh, the principal agent model uh, simply states that uh, uh, principals uh, have a sufficiently well-formed view of the world and its possibilities that they can articulate economically viable prospects uh, and that uh, on the basis of those, those plans, they can incentivize the agents, the subordinates, the, uh, ec the, the experts, uh, to pursue the activities that contrib contribute to the realization of the plan. The very general idea is that the ownership and responsibility of the corporation should be attributed to its principles, whoever it is, Whatever, whatever subject uh, has the capacity to make these uh, overarching and actionable plans and uh, incentivize agents accordingly. Now, in its generality, uh, it turns out the uh, principal agent model is very hard to apply, surprisingly hard to apply, because it's uh, extremely tricky to figure out who the principal really is. Uh, let me just illustrate that difficulty by noticing that um, from the New Deal to the present, uh, the principle of the corporation, the same, roughly speaking, the same large corporation we know today or assume as the uh, conventional representation of corporations, has changed many times. In the 30s and through the 50s, the principle was management. A management was said to be disciplined by regulation, by the influence of trade unions, and collaterally by shareholders. But it was the focus was on management and its responsibilities. Then there was the discovery that managers steal and build empires, uh, and the principal became the shareholder, as you know. And now there are myriad problems with shareholders. And there's the possibility that uh, the, there's a private equity model or perhaps a stakeholder model. And let me say, uh, just as illustration of the state of debate, um, Zohar's uh, typically inventive, ingenious 
uh, and subversive uh, uh, presentation just now uh, can be taken in one of two ways, either as a demonstration, I think, persuasive, uh, that raiders are at least as good, probably better, uh, uh, than activists, but you can also take it as an indication that neither activists uh, nor uh, nor raiders are uh, particularly uh, apt for s solving the large problems that confront corporations. If you had to choose between the two, you'd choose the raiders, but you might take the, the, the fact that it's only in that comparison that raiders look uh, unambiguously or, or, or strikingly good as, as a, a theme consistent with my thesis that the, the nature of the principle is up for grabs. Now, why does the nature of the, why does the principal agent problem come under pressure today, and why is the pressure it's coming under uh, different than what we've seen before? Uh, innovation, let me just state this as a, as an extremely flat-footed rule. Innovation is not the property of one person or a small group. Real innovation, continuing disruptive innovation is historically, by every account, is the result of a, a broad community effort. I don't mean community in the sense of a, a conscious dedication to a political effort. I mean a community of people uh, of diverse, surprisingly diverse, uh, areas of specialization and experience who come together to solve problems whose solubility was uh, unanticipated before they begin their work. The, 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 just as an illustration, uh, Henry Ford, the, the founder of what became the model of the large principal agent corporation at the key period of the invention of the, the assembly line, the the innovation that gave rise to uh, his, his fame and fortune, uh, uh, was famous in his circles for organizing exactly this kind of community effort, bringing in uh, mechanics from all over the Midwest and the world to contribute to a project whose outcome was uncertain, but prospects were, uh, were, were vast and, and proved to be uh, for, uh, fully uh, worthy of the effort. So innovation, in a sense, just by its very nature, uh, is incompatible with the idea that there's a small group of persons who know well enough what to do, and they can be made responsible for the outcome. But, of course, innovation tends to come in spurts. There are periods when, before a design is dominant, before, uh, when, when things are up in the air, and I'll come back to that in a second, uh, when when the community can exist, there's a fervent a, a, a fervor and fervent of uh, for effervescence of of creativity. When things settled settle down, as they did in the 30s and successive uh, decades, it it seems completely plausible to go to a back to a to not back to a principal agent agent model. The prospect today is of a a continuous innovation knowledge economy which makes as a permanent condition of, <clears throat> of economic competitiveness the kind of innovation that um, uh, uh, is a challenge to the principal agent model. Now that occurs in, in, in two ways. Uh, the less conspicuous way, which I'll just mention so that it's it's, it's, it's available for reflection, has to do with the internal organization of the corporation itself. So it, 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 it's a famous fact about, about the Ford Corporation and the many other corporations that in one way or another by independent discovery or emulation uh, went the same path that it did, that they were extremely hierarchically organized internally once, once they had uh, mastered a dominant design. Uh, uh, if you look at the today's advanced corporations, the, the best example of which would be Apple, uh, they do the opposite. Uh, at Apple, there is, let me, it's, it's actually hard to formulate this, uh, there, are no, there are no business people running units. The standard form of the corporation is to have 
technical experts at various levels reporting to a superior who is responsible for the bottom line of that uh, the, the, the bottom line of that unit. And the business manager is a separate, is performing a separate activity from the experts. At Apple, except at the level of the board and the layer below, directly below that, there are no such experts. Everyone in the corporation has to be fully adept at the technical activities of their uh, uh, specialization and able to communicate that to other specializations for the simple reason that the technology is changing so quickly and in such unpredictable ways that only people who are f viscerally familiar with the technology itself can assess the business prospects. So the paradox is the best business people, the, the prospects of a particular innovation, the best people are people who don't think about the business and that works. And there are close analogs in a number of other corporations. The more prominent, the more, the more prominent way of, um, a more conspicuous way of seeing uh, the, the deep changes afoot is to look at supplier relations. Uh, as many of you will know, the large corporation uh, uh, was completely dominated in traditionally has completely dominated its suppliers. It, it, it makes everything that it needs to make. You'll know from transaction cost economics that firms don't want to have uh, uh, capable partners. They don't want to depend on outside partners in the production of crucial components or at parts of their process because they want to escape holdups. I'll assume everybody understands that problem. And wanting to escape holdups, they either make things internally or retain sufficient internal capacity that they could make things internally were they threatened by a holdup. So the boundary of the corporation is coincident with the key activities that can't be exposed, that can't be put outside for fear of creating this vulnerability. Exactly that boundary is toppling today in industry after industry. One example is uh, pharmaceuticals. Big Pharma simply can't keep pace with, the, with innovation in, in all kinds of drugs, uh, cancer, vaccines. And if you, look at, if you look at the explosion of efforts to find vaccines against COVID, in case after case after case, Big Pharma partners with a small research institution that is developing the technology. Big Pharma specializes in running the trials and authorization, uh, finding collateral information where necessary to uh, uh, complement the innovation, but it itself does none of the research. And it doesn't, it's not trying to, in, in the end, replace the, the it, it's trying to augment its capacity to find such partners in the future, not build the capacity to supplant them by its own, by its own internal efforts. An even more dramatic example comes from the automobile industry, the uh, development of electrical, electric vehicles, where the drivetrain, uh, the, uh, uh, the battery power, and increasingly the uh, computer electronics that for autonomous driving, all of these are technologies alien, alien to uh, the, uh, the traditional automobile makers. And there is a consolidating understanding within the automobile industry that they will never have, even though they will radically build up their capacity to co-develop batteries, understand battery chemistry, for example, they will never have the ability to design battery management systems which have to control batteries to the molecular level while the battery is changing its chemistry as it ages and over the course of its cycle. And if the battery management system goes wrong, the battery bursts very uncomfortably into flames, they'll never be able to manage the battery management development process without 
reliance on outside manufacturers who know chemistry in a way they couldn't without stop ceasing to be uh, uh, ceasing to be car makers. The same is true of the development of autonomous uh, driving. And you have a terrific example of, of one of the new collaborators uh, in Israel. Mobileye is, ex is exactly the example of, a, of the kind of supplier who is the long-term co-developer with, with its buyer firm, not its subordinate working according to projects developed unilaterally by that firm. We see clear indications of this change in contracting relations, whereas before, some of you may be familiar with the work of Stuart Macaulay, if you, he wrote it, he was, turns out was, he was the, the son of a car dealer in Wisconsin and had a terrifically deep understanding of how cars were made in the 80s in the, in the United States. And in, in that period, the car companies could utterly dominate the industry because they had control of all the tech key technologies. And the car, the component makers had to compete to be the privileged supplier to the dominant buyers. Today, the situation is reversed in the areas of chemistry, battery design, uh, uh, autonomous, autonomous driving, computerization that I mentioned, but in many others as well. And companies like General Motors say very openly that today the, the buyer has to compete to be the privileged buyer of the very best suppliers because it's only those, who, those very best suppliers who are able to um, uh, uh, engage in the co-development at the level necessary to maintain competitiveness of the, of the buyer itself. Now, how is that reflected in contracts? Instead of the risk being unilaterally shifted, you get extremely open-ended contracts I implicating the investment of regular investment of billions of dollars of asset-specific equipment, but completely open-ended contracts in which there are very vague commitments or no commitments in many cases on either side to actually buy anything, but very deep commitments to exchange information in view of developing uh, uh, together the products which will meet the needs of the, the buyer and advance, of course, the situation of, of the supplier vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis its competitors. And raising the question where, so now we have the situation where vital decisions determining the fate of the buyer, the corporation, are being co-determined by a, a, a long-term partner outside working according to an agreement which, which only works in some sense because neither party is committing long-term to the perpetuation of the agreement. Each knows that it could be revoked unilaterally by the other, and it is utterly dependent on the results that it produces. That incentive hopefully keeps the co collaboration working fruitfully, but it certainly doesn't look like the corporation as the self-contained unit, master of the knowledge indispensable to its uh, propagation that the principal agent model in all of its various interpretations imposes. Now, what about, what about uh, corporate law? Uh, and the, the honest answer is I can, think of, uh, I can think of a case where it makes no difference and I can think of a case where it could make a difference and I, <laughs> I submit, I'd like to hear, I, if this were the kind of conference where, where we, we engaged in, in, in back and forth, I would like to hear what the back and the forth is. Uh, but I, please feel free to, to, to take up the conversation with me later. I am seriously of two minds about this. I, one of the reasons for coming was precisely to clarify for myself the two possibilities. So here they are. Possibility one is that there, these changes are momentous. They change the, the boundary of the firm. They change the contractual relation from 
a, a bizarre, elaborate mechanism that, uh, that Stuart McCauley describes in detail and to which I refer to you, to which I refer you, uh, to the contracts, these open-ended contracts that I, I've just very generally sketched. Uh, but for the very reason that these contracts presume intense, continuing, highly disciplined exchanges of information about the progress of co-development products, about the, the performance of each partner in the continuing application and development of the finished product, in, about the reliability of each to maintain quality standards, and so on and so forth. Precisely because the agreements contain this information, there is no need for, for, for a change in corporate law. The, 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 very law, the switch in the nature of contracting makes the, inf this, the, the relation so information rich to both parties that e one or the other would have to be negligent if it didn't notice that the other was falling down in its responsibility and therefore there's nothing for the court to do because the court would only say you should have known by your own monitoring system that the other side wasn't monitoring. So there's an argument in favor of the view that there's a giant change, but it doesn't affect, it, it, it goes, passes the courts by. But there's another argument that, that uh, uh, would connect with the, the Bluebell uh, kind of uh, uh, development we heard about earlier, which says, uh, well, wait a minute, these are matters that affect the public deeply, as well as the interests of the other Share of the shareholders and other stakeholders in each of the two companies. It's not really a matter of if 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 the the if if a company fails to monitor its own agreements, that may make it actionable to others. It may mean that it can't claim it it can't claim against its counterpart that it was tricked or had no inkling of what was coming. But it may be that the other members of the, cor of the other corporate stakeholders have a claim against the management of the board that was failing to do the monitoring that their own, that their own agreements implicated. Indeed, they would, it would be, with compared to ESG or other kinds of claims, it would be super clear because the protocols for these information exchanges are much more highly developed, much more consequential to the success of the business strategy firm, of the firm and so on. So I just, I just want to put this stark contrast and not cloud it by, 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 further, by, by further elaboration, which at this point would be premature. I w would like to call to your attention that there is, as I said at the outset, there is nothing speculative about this shift in the nature of the supply relation, of the shift in the nature of the boundary of the corporation, of the questions it raises at a minimum about the transaction cost view, but more generally that it raises about the principal agent view. That's first. Second, that this new relation uh, maximizes the responsibility on both sides for explicit information exchange and that can be both a model for and a spur to the further development model, the further development of the kinds of information exchange that modern regulation, whether promoted by activists or otherwise, might reasonably be imposing on corporations for other ends. So let's just say for the moment, uh, it, there's a consequential development with unforeseen consequences I hope they're for the good. Thank you very much. Thank you.